Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, have a seat and uh, relax and enjoy the worship service this morning. It's good for us to be in the house of the Lord. It's good for us to have time together. And uh, Psalm 34.3 is, is a good psalm. It's very short. It says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And so that's what we're here for this morning is to praise God and to lift up Jesus and to just have a great worship service. We're glad you're here. Let me share with you uh, some prayer needs and uh, then we'll have a prayer and begin our worship service. There is a, a, a paper on the uh, corner of the table in the foyer, if you'd like to get that, has uh, prayer needs on it and an announcement or two. But let me just highlight some of these. We want to be sure and mention uh, our music director, Margaret McGill, is not here this morning because uh, she's in Brazil with her mother. Her mother is not well, uh, probably in the last stages of her life, the last few days, hours, weeks, we don't know, but she's in the hospital. She's staying with her mother all day, she and her sisters, and then at night her brothers come and they stay in the hospital with her, but she is not well, and Margaret is down there with her mother, and she asked that we would uh, be praying for her as a congregation. She wanted you to know that... Uh, uh, what's going on there, and that uh, uh, she would like to be here, but of course with her mother down there. And then there are several who are still struggling with cancer, uh, breast cancer, stage four cancer, and uh, others who are receiving cancer treatments. We want to lift them up to the Lord. And uh, M Michelle Kelly was going to have her surgery this week, and you're going to have it in a few more, a few days from now. We'll be having her shoulder surgery, and uh, we want to keep Michelle in our prayers. And then, as she'll be going to rehab after that, and there are others on here who are going through rehab and health issues, and uh, have had surgeries, and we just want to lift them up to the Lord, and we want to pray together. We're glad you're here this morning. Glad that we can be in God's house. Let's pray, and then we'll begin our worship this morning. Thank you, Father, for your love for us. Thank you, Father, for being patient with us when we are not patient, when we are not doing the things you'd have us do. But, Father, thank you that we can be yours, we can be your children, we can obey you and do our best to serve you. Father, I do pray that you be with those who are struggling with depression loss of loved ones and uh, stresses upon them this life brings. Father, we just ask that you'd give us a hope and give us a blessing to be in your uh, house of worship today, that we might lift up Jesus in things that we say and do. Father, we pray for all these who are upon our prayer list. Uh, we want to uh, remember all of them, Father, and the needs and certainly, Father, other needs we have that have not been made public, you see our hearts and you know our needs. And we just ask that you would uh, touch our bodies, touch our minds, touch our spirits, that we would be strengthened. Help us, Father, to get a strength by being in your house of worship today that we can be closer to you. Now bless us during the hour of worship that we might lift up Jesus in all we say and do. In his name we pray. Amen.
unravel me with the melody you surround me with the song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I no longer Let me read from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17. It's not about the Lord's Supper, but I'm going to lead into the Lord's Supper. Matthew 17, the first three verses. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them, and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Our God is the God of surprises. And Peter and James and John, I, I suppose they expected an afternoon hike and perhaps a, a, a personal prayer retreat with Jesus on the mountain. But it turned into being uh, something really special blinded by Christ's radiance, observing two Old Testament heroes of the faith and beholding God's glory. Surprising, to say the least, not what they expected. But God often transforms the ordinary, everyday, even mundane, to reveal his great power and glory. This was true on the Mount of Transfiguration, and it was also true on the Mount of Crucifixion. Jesus' death appeared as the awful, though not uncommon, execution of another criminal. But God is the God of surprises. On the cross, Jesus seemed to dash the hope of his disciples. But really, he was fulfilling the work of their Christ. He submitted to the torture of the Romans and so became the Lord of the Romans and of every nation in the world. He truly died. And by his death, he ensured the future resurrection of all his people. All of those are glorious surprises. And there will be the day when we will see fully revealed the promises of Christ his lordship over all creation, and the final resurrection of the dead. But that which comes at the end, God gives us a glimpse of now as we partake of the Lord's Supper. As those three apostles glimpsed the power and glory of Jesus, so we experience Christ's promise. Through salvation, we experience redemption from death and even a taste of the heavenly feast in this, the Lord's Supper. So we have before us ordinary bread and juice, and we come in obedience to Jesus. We pray, we sing, we eat and drink, we proclaim the Lord's death just like he told us to. We do all this 
in faith, knowing that God has the power to transform death into resurrection, to transform weakness into power, to transform a few loaves into a feast. And so we come this morning knowing that he is the God of surprises. Let's pray, and then we'll partake. Thank you, Father, for salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the surprise uh, to the world that he would not just be crucified and buried, but on the third day he would rise to die nevermore, to live forever at your right hand, Father. And now we pray as we partake of this communion that we are communing with Christ and with each other and drawn closer to you, our Father. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's partake of the bread and the juice. Good morning. How's everybody doing? A little soggy? That's all right. Uh, would you pray with me uh, before we get started? God, thank you so much for uh, this warm, dry place that we can come together and worship you. Uh, thank you so much for your love, your grace, your forgiveness. Thank you so much for caring about us and providing for us and, and blessing us with so much. Thank you for sending your son into this world to die for us. God, during this time, I pray that uh, you would help us all to uh, forget the distractions and, and just focus on you and what it is that, that you have uh, for us this morning. And uh, I pray that uh, through this message, our, our faith in you and your word would be strengthened. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. In 1844... A German professor of New Testament at Leipzig University named Constantine Tischendorf traveled to Cairo, Egypt. He mounted a camel and uh, traversed the nearly 200 miles through the desert to the traditional site of Mount Sinai. At the base of the mountain was the St. Catherine Monastery. 
Uh, the monastery was built on the site of the Chapel of the Burning Bush, uh, which was commissioned to be built by um, the mother of Emperor Constantine, uh, who believed the site to be the biblical Mount Sinai. Uh, the monastery was built between 548 and 565 and is the oldest operating monastery in the world. Uh, when Tischendorf arrived in 1844, the monastery had continuously been operating for over 1,300 years. As he was staying at the monastery, uh, he happened to notice there was a large pile of papyrus leaves in a trash bin. Uh, he, he pulled them out and he, he recognized them as copies of the Septuagint, uh, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, he later found out that the monks had been using the papyrus leaves to start fires in the fireplace. They didn't know what, they didn't know what it was. Uh, he pulled out 129 leaves and he began to feverishly study them. He studied them all night without going to sleep at all. Uh, he would later would write that he thought it seemed sacrilegious to sleep after such a discovery. Uh, studying ancient manuscripts was his life's work. And he, he was able to negotiate with the monks at the monastery, and they allowed him to take 43 of the papyrus leaves back to Leipzig. After studying them, he was able to date them to the 4th century A.D. Tischendorf traveled back to St. Catherine Monastery in 1859, 15 years later, under the direction of Tsar Alexander II. Now, this time, the monks knew the value of their manuscripts, and so they hid them from Tischendorf. Uh, he stayed there for two weeks, and eventually became resigned to not being allowed to view any of them. But just before he was set to return home, one of the monks who worked in the kitchen showed him a manuscript that was wrapped in cloth that had been hidden in the food pantry. Tischendorf realized that this manuscript was a copy of the entire New Testament. Uh, Tischendorf was able to take this manuscript back to Moscow. Now, this ma manuscript is called Codex Sinaiticus and is the oldest copy that we have in existence of the entire New Testament. The British Library purchased Codex Sinaiticus in 1933 for 100,000 pounds. You can go see it today in London in the British Museum. And he bought this from the, uh, the atheist Soviets who had uh, no use for an ancient manuscript, a Christian manuscript. And at the time, this, purchase, this book purchase of 100,000 pounds was the most expensive book purchase in history. To this date, there are only four complete Greek Bibles in existence, all dated to within a few hundred years of the first century, Sinaiticus being one of them. Uh, the Bible is the best-selling book ever, selling over five billion copies. But it's also the most criticized. The Bible makes some pretty bold claims about itself. Take 2 Timothy 3.16, for example. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Breathed out by God. Or 2 Peter 1.21. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Bible claims to contain messages from God. But does it really? Or is it all just made up? Can we actually trust the Bible? Is it reliable? Is it true? Or is it just a bunch of fairy tales? I was told this morning that Bill Maher called it the Jewish book of fairy tales. 
But this morning, uh, I want to offer you some strong evidence to show that the Bible is trustworthy and reliable. Uh, The words that are contained in the pages of this book are indeed true. And not just made up by rich guys with pointy hats, which is a claim that some people make. And we're in the final week of this sermon series called Reason to Believe. Uh, Over the past couple weeks, we have talked about uh, how we can know that God exists because philosophy and science actually point to a creator. We talked about the evidence that the resurrection of Jesus was a historical event. And because of it, we can know that he is the one true God. He is the one that resurrected from the grave. And because of that, all his claims about being God are true. He's the creator God who has, ex- who has always existed. Uh, but our evidence for the resurrection mostly comes from the Bible itself. And so if the Bible is proven to be made up, unhistorical or contradictory in some way, then the resurrection account in the Bible cannot be trusted. If the resurrection account can't be trusted... Uh, then we have no way of knowing who God is or what He demands for our life. So it's very important that we know whether the Bible is accurate or not, whether it is true or not. Uh, When I was baptized, I was nine years old. And just like many of you probably, I was given a Bible. I was given a student Bible. Uh, It had information at the beginning of each book. Uh, It had little information boxes that gave additional information about the text. Many of you probably have a similar type study Bible. And it was very helpful to me uh, when when I was first beginning to learn about the Bible. But when I was nine, I knew very little about the Bible. Uh, I knew that I did bad things called sins, and I knew that I didn't want to go to hell. But that was about all I knew about anything the Bible said. I went to Sunday school. I learned things like there was a kid named David who killed a giant. And uh, there were two people named Ananias and Sapphira, and they got together to conspire. They lied to Simon Peter, and they both dropped dead. Huh. That was, that was an old uh, uh, Sunday school song. God loves a cheerful giver. Give it all you got. We sing that in Sunday school. <laughs> that was about all I knew at the age of nine, about the Bible. But even at nine years old, I knew that this was an important book that I needed to read. So I tried to read it. I started at the very beginning at Genesis, and I read through Exodus. Uh, Those two books tell a story, so it was a little bit easier to read than other parts of the Bible. And I understood some of it. But then I got to Leviticus. And... (laughs) And that's just a book of laws. And that's when I gave up. I went to church my entire life and I learned things about the Bible. Uh, I went to youth group and I heard sermons about the Bible. But I hardly ever read it. If the Bible does contain a message from the creator of the universe, we should probably take some time to read it. I think so, anyway. Uh, But there are many people who say that the Bible is just a bunch of made-up fairy tales. Or they they say it it contains all kinds of contradictions. Or that it was written so long ago, how can we even really know that what we have now, what we are actually reading now, is the original message that God even gave? Kind of like the, the game of telephone. Have you ever played that? Uh, Maybe the message has gotten messed up over time through the translations. What we don't really have, we we don't really have what was originally written down. These are all legitimate questions about the Bible. And so uh, let me go through three common criticisms this morning about the reliability of the Bible and let me answer them. Uh, The first criticism of the Bible the many people say is that uh, there were some rich guys and they got together and they wanted to control people. And so they put together this book so that people would be afraid and that they could control them. 
This is an argument that some people make about the Bible. That it was a top-down document. That, that it was used by powerful people to control the weak. Well, that could not be any further from the truth. It is very much true about the vast majority of historical documents that the people in power wrote them to and used them to legitimize their power, but not the Bible. The Bible was written largely by people who did not have any power at all. Most of the authors of the Bible were among the common people. And even the ones who did have power, like Moses and David and Solomon, there are some very embarrassing details of their life included in their stories. Moses murdered someone in cold blood. David had a kid with his mistress out of wedlock. Solomon was one of the most prolific womanizers of all time. The Bible tells their story, but it does not legitimize their power. It, in fact, shows why they should, should, probably should not have been in power. The Bible tells the story not of why powerful people should have power, like most historical documents. It tells the story of the plight of the marginalized and how God provided for them. And the Bible was not compiled in a way that legitimized power. It, it was compiled in a way that legitimized the story of God. Uh, not because there were books left out that disproved what was left in. No, in fact, it was the opposite. What was left in disproved what was left out. Uh, by the first century, when uh, Jesus lived, during the time when Jesus lived, the Torah, what we call the Old Testament, was already canonized. That means uh, that Jewish rabbis and scholars, they got together and they gathered together all of their ancient writings and they went through each one. And they determined which ones were included in the Torah and which ones were excluded. These Jewish scholars, they used certain criteria to winnow, winnow out the books that were most likely made up and leave in the ones that they knew were not. Now, the criteria they used were things like whether or not the book was recognized to be written by a prophet or by someone who had a personal experience with God. People like Moses or Jeremiah or Isaiah. Now, whether or not the books were internally consistent, meaning that there wasn't anything in the book that contradicted something else. That was also in that book. If the book itself contained contradictions, if it contradicted itself, there were many documents that did contradict themselves. Then they could not be trusted, and so it was left out. Uh, whether or not these books were externally consistent, meaning that they didn't contradict any other canonized book. Uh, there, were, there are certain books that contain verifiable information. If there was a book that contained information that contradicted what was known to be absolutely true, it was left out. There were 39 books that made the cut, and many more that did not. In the 4th century, uh, Christian scholars got together and they did the exact same thing with the New Testament. They got all of their sacred writings, and they used the same exact criteria to winnow out the books that they believed to contain false information. And they left in the ones that did not. 27 of those writings made the cut for a grand total of 66 books in the Bible. And the Bible, the Bible was not compiled by the powerful to legitimize their power. It was compiled by the marginalized to tell the story of God and his people. The Bible is not a book so much as a library. It is a collection of 66 writings written by 40 different people on three different continents over the course of 1,600 years. 
All of these books come together to tell one story. The story of how God saved his people. To me, that is absolutely remarkable. That these books could be so consistent. That over the course of that time, through so many different hands, they tell a consistent story. However, many people say, well, of course it's consistent. It's been edited over time to be consistent. That's the second criticism of the Bible, that the words that we have were not the original words written down. That it was written thousands of years ago, and it's been translated so many times that it's really impossible to really know for sure that what we're reading, what was originally written down. Things have gotten lost in translation. Things have been added. Things have been taken out. Things have gotten changed over time. Well, there is an entire field of study that attempts to answer that very criticism. It's called textual criticism. And in my opinion, it's a very boring field of study. Uh, some people love it and more power to them, but uh, I think it's very boring. Uh, but basically what textual critics do is they take an old manuscript like the Codex Sinaiticus and, uh, that Professor Tischendorf found, and they compare it with another manuscript. They go through uh, both documents and they, they look completely identical, uh, but there are minor differences as they study them. Uh, did you ever play those games as a kid where you had two pictures? They, they look identical, but there's these tiny little differences that you have to point out and you have to circle the differences, right? That's basically what these guys do. They go through and compare two documents that appear to be identical and they find the differences. They try to find inconsistencies in the documents. An inconsistency is called a textual variant. And there are 400,000 textual variants in just the New Testament alone. 400,000. Well, there you go. That answers it, right? The Bible is full of contradictions. It can't be trusted. Well, let me tell you about these textual variants. The number of textual variants uh, isn't really that big of a concern. It sounds, sounds bad, right? There's 400,000, but that's really not the big deal. I mean, if I were to give out each one of you a, a Stephen King novel, for instance, and, and tell each one of you to hand copy it, there would be just as many textual variants among all the different copies that all of you make. Things happen. People make mistakes when they're copying things by hand. It's not the number or the quantity of the variants that really matter. It's the quality what kind of mistake is it? 70% of all textual variants are simple spelling mistakes. The copier uh, left out a letter of a word, or uh, he misspelled uh, a word in some way. 70% of all those textual variants are just simple spelling errors. Does a spelling mistake change the meaning of the text? No. The text still has the same meaning. And it's very easy to know what was in the original because we know how to spell the word. Of the other 30% of those textual variants, they fall into three different kinds, three different categories of variations. Some of those uh, variations are difficult to know what was the original wording. Well, we don't know exactly what was originally written down. But even though we don't know how it was originally written down, the meaning of the text doesn't change either way. I'll give you one example. Uh, one example is the spelling of the Apostle John's name in Greek. Sometimes it's spelled with one new, uh, which is the Greek letter for our English letter N. Sometimes his name is spelled with two news. 
And we don't know how he originally spelled his own name. It could have been with one new. It could have been with two news. We don't really know how his name was originally spelled in Greek. But that doesn't change the meaning of the text. Anytime it refers to the Apostle John, it's referring to the same person. It's still talking about the Apostle John. It doesn't change the meaning of the text. Uh, There are some variants that do change the meaning of the text. Uh, But we know for sure they were not in the original manuscript. They were just a copy mistake. Uh, For instance, at Luke 6.22, it says this, Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Of all the copies that we have of this text, there's one copy that leaves out, that excludes the last portion of that verse on account of the Son of Man. That that changes the meaning of that verse, doesn't it? Blessed are you when people hate you versus blessed are you when people hate you on account of the Son of Man. That changes the meaning of the text, but it is only one copy. And so we know that the original copy had that last portion. Whoever made that one copy left out that last portion of that verse, probably because of a simple oversight. Uh, They skipped a line. Maybe they lost their place when they looked away to make the copy. Easy mistake to do. Uh, The fourth category of variants are ones that do change the meaning of the text And it is impossible to know for sure what was in the original. These are the ones that are significant. Because these are the ones that cast aspersion on the veracity of the Bible. These are the ones that people refer to when they make the claim that we can't know what was originally written down. But less than 1% of the textual variants fall into this category. Well, then you say, well, 1% of 400,000 is still 4,000 textual variants. <laughs> that seems like a lot. Well, let me give you an example of what these variants are like. 1 John 1.4. It says, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Some manuscripts say our joy. Other manuscripts say your joy. We can't know for sure what John originally wrote, whether it was ours or yours. Whose joy may be complete? John's and his companions or his readers? I'll be honest, that is a a mystery that just might never be solved. We don't know what John originally meant in that verse, but is that inconsistency big enough to rattle your faith in the Bible. I don't know, personally, I think either way it's fine. Whether uh, whoever's joy is complete, made complete is fine with me. Those are the types of variants found among all the different copies of the Bible. Simple little silly differences like that. None of them change the main point of the Bible. That Jesus died on the cross for the sins of mankind. And he rose from the dead three days later. It doesn't change the message of grace and forgiveness and that eternal life is found in Christ. The textual variant that Bible critics critics are looking for is that Jesus didn't really die. That he escaped to India, he got married, had 15 kids. But the Da Vinci Code, it just isn't there. Oh, but then you, you might say, well, okay, all right, these, these are just minor variations in the text, but, but still, we're, we're talking about thousands of years between then and now. The King James Version of the Bible was completed in 1611. That's, 1500, that's a 1,500-year 1500 difference. What we have now are copies of copies of copies of copies. The copies might line up with each other, but how reliable are these copies? 
Well, the Bible isn't the only ancient document that we have copies of that we use to compare with each other to verify their accuracy. For instance, uh, we have seven copies of the works of Plato. Historians take those seven copies and they, they compare them with one another to make sure that they are accurate. Uh, Moreover, uh, Plato lived 350 B.C. Uh, That's that's when he wrote his works, in 350 B.C. The earliest copy that we have of his works is dated about 900 A.D. That is a 1,250-year gap between when he wrote and the earliest copy that we have. There isn't one single historian that questions whether the works of Plato have been doctored over time. Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars were written in 50 BC. We have 10 copies of that work. And the earliest copy that we have is from 950 AD. That's a thousand year difference. Nobody questions the authenticity of those 10 copies. One of the greatest sources of the history of the Roman Empire that we have is Tacitus's history. It was completed about 117 AD. And the earliest copy that we have is about 800 years after that, at 850 AD. And we only have two copies of that. But nobody questions the reliability of Tacitus's history. But people do question the reliability of the Bible. Do you know how many copies we have of the New Testament? Two, seven, ten. Try 5,800. And that's just the Greek manuscripts. There are 10,000 manuscripts translated in Latin and 9,300 other manuscripts copied in a variety of other languages. That's a total of 25,000 copies of the New Testament. Uh, the, writer, the writings of John were the last books to be written in the New Testament. He wrote his books about 95 A.D. How long do you think it was in between when he wrote his books and the earliest copy that we have? 1,250 years? 1,000 years? 800 years? The earliest copy we have is dated to 135. That's 40 years. Yeah, but, but that, that's, the only, that's only the New Testament, right? Well, there are also 10,000 Old Testament manuscripts. Uh, up until 1947, the oldest manuscript of the Old Testament were dated to the 10th century A.D. This, this was called the Masoretic Text. It's what was used uh, to translate the King James Bible. Uh, but in 1947, a shepherd boy lost one of his sheep in the, the, the area of Israel called Qumran. And he went off searching for it into the desert. And he was throwing rocks into a cave to try to scare the sheep to come out. Instead of hearing the bleat of a sheep, he heard a jar break. He went in and he found ancient Hebrew manuscripts in those jars. Old Testament manuscripts dated to the 3rd century B.C. That's 1,300 years earlier than the earliest copy that we had up to that point. All of the manuscripts that we have in our possession agree with each other 99% of the time. To me, that's absolutely overwhelming. There is no other historical document that even comes close to that. And the third criticism is that it's historically inaccurate. It isn't a historical book because it doesn't line up with the historical record. Uh, Anyone who makes this claim just doesn't know what they're talking about. It, It used to be a legitimate argument a few hundred years ago before modern archaeology. But in the last couple hundred years, there have been over 25,000 people, places, or things in the Bible that have been affirmed by archaeology. Uh, Previously, there was no historical record of them. 
outside the Bible, but archaeology has since affirmed the Bible to be accurate and our historical record was what needed to be updated. Uh, let me give you just two of those examples. Uh, for years, there was no evidence that there was ever a group of people known as the Hittites. Uh, scholars and, and Bible critics claimed that the authors of the Bible, they just made up that there was anyone who was ever known as a Hittite. But in 1834, French archaeologist Charles Texier, he uncovered the ruins of the ancient Hittite capital of Hattusa, affirming the biblical record. There was no evidence outside the Bible that there was ever a king of Israel named David. No historical record ever containing the name David at all. That is until 1993. When an archaeology team was doing a dig in an area of Israel called Tel Dan. Now, one archaeologist just happened to place his equipment uh, against a nearly 3,000 year old wall that was built out of stones. And it was uh, later in the day and so the sun was hitting this wall at just the right angle that the stone, the stones at the bottom of the wall, which were partially buried, appeared to have an inscription. He was able to see this because of the angle of the light. And he bent down to look at it, and he recognized this inscription as ancient lettering. He called over the director of the dig, and they uncovered the stone and the rest of the inscription, which read in Ar Aramaic, House of David. Over 25,000 people, places, or things in the Bible affirmed by archaeology. And how many archaeological discoveries have disproved something in the Bible? Not one. There is no doubt that the books that we have in the Bible are the ones that should be in there because of their remarkable consistency with one another. There's no doubt that the words that we have in these books are the words that were originally written. And there's no doubt that it is historically accurate. That means that the accounts recorded within these pages are absolutely reliable. The Bible hasn't been changed or altered over time, and there are no great contradictions or inconsistencies that would cast aspersions on whether or not we can trust the Bible. So, if we know that the Bible is accurate, and it's the original message that was written down. And it hasn't cha been changed or corrupted. And if we know that the Bible is internally and externally consistent, there aren't any major contradictions that aren't accounted for by simple uh, spelling errors or copying mistakes. And it's undoubtedly historically accurate, then we can absolutely trust it. But that also means that the Bible is right when it calls certain things sins. The Bible is right when it says that the wages of sin is death. It is right when it says that we deserve hell for our sins. But the Bible is also right when it says that there is hope. There is restoration. Our sin leads us to death and despair pain and suffering, but the message of the Bible is that God cared enough about our situation to come here on earth and do something about it. He sent His Son into this world to die on the cross so that He could defeat death and pay the penalty for our sins. Uh, but the Bible says, if you do not place your faith and trust in His Son, Jesus Christ, and be buried in the waters of baptism, you are still in your sins. But you can choose today to do that, to place your faith in Him and be baptized. If you want to put your faith and trust in Him this morning, I invite you to come forward during this next song. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this incredible evidence that proves that every word that we have in your word is true. That we can trust the message, the message of hope, 
the message that you sent your son into this world for us. God, I pray for anyone here who has not ever placed their faith and trust in that message, in your son, that they would do so today. I pray that this evidence would give us boldness and confidence to share that message with as many people as we can. To tell people who are far from you that there is hope. There's hope in your word. There's hope in your son. And then all that they have to do is trust in it. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Thank you.